Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Aram Lecture on Business Ethics. My name is Ken Anderson. I'm the Dean of the Business School here at Gonzaga, and I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight for this outstanding program. Uh, one programming note, uh, next Thursday, we also have another uh, excellent event planned. Uh, we will be featuring Chris Lowney, noted leadership writer and speaker uh, as part of the uh, inaugural Canfield Family Lifelong Learning Lecture Series. Yeah, so maybe. that'll be next Thursday at six as well. So please try to make plans to, to join us for that. Uh, as we get going tonight, the first thing I wanna do is introduce our host, Brian Steverson. Uh, many of you know Brian, he is a professor of business ethics here at Gonzaga. He also holds the Aram Chair in Business Ethics. He is one of the finest professors in the university, an outstanding teacher, uh, a noted scholar, and uh, probably more importantly for all of you tonight, uh, just an incredible host. So Brian, uh, take it away. Hey, Dean Anderson. Uh, way to set it up with no pressure, but I'll, I'll do my best. So I too wanna to welcome everyone to the uh, 2020 uh, Aram Lecture in Business Ethics. This is our anchor event uh, for Ethics Week here at the Gonzaga School of Business Administration. So just a few uh, logistics. Um, we plan to end right around 7.30, thereabouts. Um, so um, uh, hopefully you can all stay around for the entirety of the event. If you will, please remain muted uh, during the um, uh, event. Um, if you have questions that you'd like to uh, submit to Julie, please submit them in the chat box. Uh, Professor Lighthouser and I will be curating those um, uh, questions. Perhaps some of them we can combine together into a single question. And we will take some time at the end of the evening to uh, um, uh, give those questions to Julie for her to uh, field. Um, I do have a few thank yous I want to make, and I'll make them quick because I'm notorious for giving long thank yous at the beginning of events. Um, of course, I want to extend a thank you to our Dean, uh, Dean Ken Anderson for his support, not just of this event, but of Ethics Week uh, here at GU. Um, I haven't actually done the research to, to um, support this, but I would be very surprised if there's another um, School of Business Administration that has a Dean that supports an entire week devoted to business ethics. Uh, that's quite remarkable. Uh, and we thank Dr. Anderson for uh, his support in that respect. Uh, also a special thanks to AJ Hawk, um, our marketing and special projects coordinator here at the School of Business Administration for her work in planning and pulling off tonight's event. As with most of the events that uh, we host, um, this simply wouldn't be possible without AJ and the work that she does. So again, AJ, thank you very much for that. Um, a little background, a little history for um, the Aram Lecture. This lecture series is named in honor uh, of the late Mr. John L. Aram, a longtime trustee and benefactor of Gonzaga University. Mr. Aram's long and distinguished service to the forest industry spurred a number of timber companies and the George F. Jewett Foundation and many industry associate and friends to establish the Aram Chair in Business Ethics in 1988. It's intended to be a tribute to a man whose life exemplified a commitment to ethical values in his business career and personal endeavors. The first visiting Aram Professor of Business Ethics was hosted by the School of Business Administration and the university in October of 1992. I'm so very privileged to be the current occupant of the Aram Chair and hope that this Aram Lecture Series will continue to serve the vision that Mr. Aram had for the role of ethics education and business. So with that said, I want to introduce to you our 2020 and 12th annual Aram Lecture on Business Ethics, Julie Fry. Julie is a principal for the $2.5 billion strategic investing arm of the Gates Foundation. She uses investment tools to support companies who are driving innovations that are critical to achieving the foundation's ambitious goals in global health, global development, and U.S. education. Julie has spent the past 17 years putting her Gonzaga finance and accounting degrees to work by making and managing investments across four continents, always focused at the intersection between doing good and doing well. 
Julie lives in Seattle with her husband and two boys. With that, please welcome our 2020 Aram Lecturer in Business Ethics, Julie Fry. Thank you so much, Dr. Severson. I am privileged to be here with all of you. And I will note um, that it was a few years ago that I had both Dr. Anderson and Dr. Severson as professors. Um, so it's great to be with you. Before I dive in, I just want to share that um, I spoke with Dr. Anderson a couple weeks ago. And one thing that he noted is how incredibly well the Gonzaga community has come together in the midst of these very difficult circumstances that our world is living today. He talked about how well the community is helping each other. He spoke of how just great education is continuing um, to meet the, the needs of students. Um, and I am not surprised in the least, but I am thrilled to hear that. I also think that these very difficult times will lead all of you to have enduring friendships that will last years and years past what you are experiencing today. My dearest friends continue to be many people from Gonzaga, and they have done incredible things with their lives, as all of you who are students will too. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So what I want to talk to you tonight is about ethics and equity in the midst of the pandemic. We are all deeply involved in everything that is going on in our world, and that has complicated each and every one of our lives, but sometimes in very different ways. And what complicates things for me is probably very different from you. And it's certainly incredibly different to how it complicates people who are low wage earners, whether that be in the US or in low and middle income countries throughout the world. But first, before I dive in, I need to talk a little bit about how our incredibly logical brains are not always as trustworthy as we would assume they are. As many of you know, there's been an internal conflict going on in Syria for many years at this point in time. Between 2010 and 2015, 250,000 people lost their lives in that conflict. But truthfully, the world has given that conflict very little attention relative to the size and scale of what is going on in that country and how people are suffering there. And I can show you that because one of the things that Google does is it tracks how often people research different terms. And this is a relative scale, so it's a little bit tricky to read. But basically what it's saying is that for a long time, people would periodically search for it and the global community would pay a little bit of attention to this issue, but not very much. And then on September 3rd, 2015, something very dramatic happened. And it was this. Tragically, a three-year-old boy named Alan Kurdi died. He drowned as he was trying to get to the Turkish coast, a safer place for him and his family to live. And the world stopped and the world paid attention for a moment to what was going on in Syria. And the tragedy of that moment is for Alan, and it's also for each one of the 250,000 other people represented in this graph. And this is where I say our minds are incredibly unreliable because we cannot process this information. If three days hence I reached out to you and we talked about what you remembered from what I present tonight, you might remember the picture of Alan. You might remember this red graph, but almost none of us would remember the number 250,000 because it doesn't make sense. Our brains cannot process large numbers and we don't know what to do with them. But that's not the end of the story because our brains do even something more with that, more illogical if that's possible. You'll see on the right-hand side of this, of this set of graphs, we have something called compassion collapse. If I were to meet a person today and they needed $500 a month for housing for the next six months, and they were otherwise going to be homeless, but with that $500, they could get housing, they could get a job, things could start to really fall in place with them. If I had that money available to me, or if most people had that money available to them, they would give it to them. If two people were in the exact same situation, 
and person and the first person needed five hundred dollars a, a month to get out of that situation and the second person needed five hundred dollars a month to get out of that situation and i had the available cash i might give them each two hundred dollars to help them per month and what's amazing about that is that's not only less per person, but that's less in total. I was gonna give $500 a month when I knew only one person was suffering. But when two people were suffering, I gave $400. People are less willing to help one person when they understand how broad the suffering can be. And that, that is particularly true when we think we can just solve a drop in the bucket of the massive problem. So here's the thing, our brains cannot process large numbers. And when we see a really big problem, we tend to walk away from it. We tend to look away from it because we don't, we simply don't know what to do with it. So let's bring this back to COVID and what this means for us. For most of the world, when COVID hit, it was really hard to understand why we needed to wear a mask, why we needed to change things, why we needed to do something. Did I know someone who had been deeply affected by it? Did you know someone who had been deeply affected by it? The numbers in the media didn't make sense to us. To date, we know that more than a million people have directly died from COVID. We actually think that number is much larger, but those are the ones who have been counted. And there's a whole huge host of other people who have passed away because of circumstances related to COVID, even though they never may never have gotten the disease. But it's really hard for our minds to wrap around that I can do something small and collectively, if we all do something small, it can make a difference. But we're starting to see that in really positive ways. We're starting to see that with simple things that all of us can do, like wearing masks. We're starting to see that in ways that we take care of each other. We're seeing greater donations to food banks who are in desperate need of funding right now because of how many people who have lost their jobs or have otherwise been affected. As Dr. Stevenson said, I work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And as we think about frac all of our work that we do at the foundation is around fractional solutions. We primarily focus on infectious disease and those are diseases that disproportionately receive very little funding relative to the suffering that's happening in the world. Those are diseases like HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, and pneumonia, which in the US is known for really affecting older people. But in, in many countries, it's actually um, the top killer of young children under the age of five. When COVID hit in March or so, we started to have to make really difficult decisions. How do we continue the work that we're doing already? How do we think about funding and our time between supporting COVID and supporting something like malaria? These are difficult trade-offs and of course we never want to make trade-offs, we just want to do more, but sometimes we can't always do more. And so what we did is what the foundation often does is we dove into the data to say, how can we think about the best use of our time and our resources? And one of the things that we noticed was happening was particularly as it related to COVID, of the limited supplies that were available, they almost exclusively went to high income countries because high-income countries can do a few things very well that low-income countries simply cannot. First and foremost, high-income countries have money, which means two really important things. It means that they can pay more for things that low-income countries simply can't afford. It also means that they can pay cash immediately. If the US needs more money to buy things, they can issue debt, they can do a lot of different things. They can have the cash in the bank, they can buy things on credit, everyone knows the US will pay you back. If I'm a small country in Africa, I'm probably dependent on a third party giving me a loan just to buy the same PPE. And that loan might take three months to process. And creditors don't wanna work with me because that loan, I don't know exactly when that loan will come in, so they don't know when I'm going to pay them back. And there's a lot of things stacked up against low-income countries that make it incredibly hard to have the exact same access to, the, to products and supplies that could help in it against um, the fight of COVID. They simply just don't have that access, even if they were to pay the same amount of money that we would pay in the US, it's still exponentially harder for them to access it. 
And we notice this particularly with diagnostic testing. So currently today, in high income countries, they are testing people more than 20 times more than they are in low income countries. We're starting to see more and more testing in very positive ways. We're starting to see it at airports. Some schools are able to test for, for COVID and that does dramatic things for our mental health, for our social health, for our economy as we're able to open up more and more. In many low income countries, they're not even able to test at the central hospitals, at the largest hospitals in these countries because they simply do not have enough tests. And what that means when you have very limited number of doctors and you have a very limited number of supplies and medicines, you have to make difficult choices with zero data. Recognizing that tremendous challenge, we went to a couple of the largest manufacturers in the world of these new novel diagnostic tests. And these are tests that are, um, they started being manufactured and approved by the FDA in August of this year. So they're very recent. And what they can do is they can give you a test result in about 15 minutes. And they have really novel things like if any of you have been tested, you can just test in the nasal as opposed to going way back. There's a lot of benefits to them. And having watched what happened with the early tests, we, our concern was that they were going to go exclusively to high income countries and that no one in low income countries would have, would have the accessibility to these tests. So we went to the large manufacturers and we said to them, please, please set aside for us 120 million tests. We promise you, and we obviously signed this contractually, that if low income countries don't buy these, we will buy them but please don't give them just to high income countries. Now that's a difficult thing to say, right? Because in high income countries, we should have rights to a lot of tests too, right? And we, and we should, it's right. But we also have to think about some of the trade-offs. Some of the trade-offs of why we want tests in high income countries are, is so that we can have a little bit more flexibility with our lifestyle. And some of the trade-offs that are being made in low income countries are much more dire. And we really felt that we had an ethical um, an imperative looking at equity to say everyone in the world and all countries in the world deserve to have some level of access to testing. And that gets me to my third and final point. Our brains can't process large numbers, but even if we can't solve the whole problem, solving portions of the problem really make a difference. And we need to take action based on a lot of data of what makes, what are the best decisions that we can make. And I think even more than the diagnostics example that I just gave, we see one coming up with vaccines, depending on how much you follow global health and depending on how much you follow what's going on with COVID, you may or may not know that there's a huge discussion going on in the world right now about who should get the first vaccines. There are many people who believe that the first vaccine should go to who can pay the most money or whatever countries develop those vaccines. There's other, there's other arguments that say these should be distributed equitably based on total populations in each of the countries. And there's a whole myriad of solutions that try to get at what is the right thing that we should be doing in this space. What may surprise you though, is it's not just a trade-off. It's not just a kind of a free market argument of I, sh I can pay more, so therefore I should get it first. Because it's not actually a zero sum game in the same way that you might think it is. Based on a lot of research done out of Northeastern University, we know something very specific about how we distribute the first 3 billion vaccines in the world. And it's this. If we were to distribute the first vaccines in the world to the highest income countries and go down the list, we would avert about 33% of the deaths could be avoided by having these vaccines. If you took that same number of vaccines and distributed it purely by population throughout the world, as opposed to who has the most money, you would almost double the number of lives saved by doing that. It's dramatic. And the question is why, what is going on there? And there's a lot of things going on behind that dramatic difference. But what we can tell you is the dramatic difference is real. Some of those reasons are things like this. Even in the US when vaccines are first distributed, they will 
first go to healthcare workers who have put themselves on the line over and over again and risk their lives to help take care of the rest of us. They are at highest risk for getting this disease and they are critical to being able to take care of our country and we need to take care of them. There are secondary and tertiary areas of people that need to be taken care of in the United States in terms of including vulnerable populations and other, other people who, have no, who, who are essential workers. These same populations exist in low income countries. And so as we think about equitable distribution of the, of the vaccine, we need to not only think about how do we distribute in the US, but we need to be thinking about how we take care of our global population. Bill and Melinda Gates play a very active role in our foundation. And one of Bill's recent quotes on this topic really resonated for me. You have to figure out your end goal and then say to everybody, for the good of the world, let's cooperate in a way that is unprecedented. The other thing that I think is oftentimes hard for us to realize in the day-to-day -day chaos that's caused right now, and it really is chaotic for many, many people, is the real sacrifices that people throughout our world, I don't care what country you live in, are making. But I want to tell you a little story about Irini. She's a woman in, in Kenya. She lives in Nairobi with her five children. And this is a story that was in the Washington Post recently that followed six families throughout the world over the first six months of the pandemic. Irini's husband died a couple years back and she is a single mom with five children and she is HIV positive. And when the pandemic hit, Kenya, like many countries in the world, had different economic shutdowns. And many people in a lot of these countries have no access to safety nets. There simply are not the safety nets. Your safety nets are your neighbor or your friend or whomever might have a little extra to share. And she lost her job and she has really, really struggled to take care and feed her children. And one night she was walking home as she's continued to find piecemeal work to do. And she saw a baby that was left out in the cold because whoever the parents were of this child were unable to take care of this baby. And so they left it on the side of the road. And she picked up this baby and she took her home and she's named the baby Blessing. And she's brought her into the family and she still every day struggles to figure out how she's going to feed her family and how she's going to have enough money to take her antiretrovirals that are needed to help keep her HIV in check. But she also knew that this baby deserved the same chance that everyone else deserved. And she's made huge sacrifices. And I'm constantly inspired by so many people throughout the world who are struggling with so much and who have looked to their neighbors and their friends and said, I can do more. And I'd love to think, to turn it to all of you and think about our local community as well. One of the things that's been True, always true about Gonzaga is it brings in students of a huge variety of economic backgrounds. And that's super important for a lot of different reasons because it's really important that we understand the different situations that people come from. Many of us who live in what are considered high wage jobs, whether that be in Seattle or Spokane or Boise or wherever, the data is actually relatively similar across. Um, I, looked at, I looked at Seattle, I looked at Boise, the data was very similar and I, I presume it's very similar for Spokane. High wage earners for the most part, since things have changed over the past six months, have resumed their previous wages. Things have not changed at almost at all, um, but for a blip in time. Middle wage workers, it's a little bit more difficult, but low wage workers, the workers who tend not to have large savings accounts who already had a variety of struggles, nearly 20% of those in Seattle and I think in Spokane and in Boise, have not gotten back their jobs. They're still struggling every day to figure out a huge variety of circumstances of how they feed their families. If kids are in school, how they pay for internet so that their kids can continue online learning if they're, if they're not meeting in school. Huge sets of complications. And the reason I bring that up is because I want to challenge everyone on this call to go back to what I said at the beginning. 
our brains can't process large numbers. It's hard for us to understand if we look across the globe at everything that's happened. And even if we look in our own communities, it's hard to understand the magnitude of what's happening. But even small solutions, even small things, and that can be conversations with family that can make choices like washing your hands and wearing masks, that can be giving to food banks, that can be anything, those things collectively save lives. So take action, decide for yourself, do a little bit more research, you know, pay attention to things like this data and really understand what's going on in your community and think, what can I do? And don't be intimidated if it feels small, if it feels little, because collectively it's not little, it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. And I think if anything that Gonzaga has taught us all is that we all have tremendous gifts and we can all do great things in the world. And especially if we work together. For those of you who are students and are attending um, with uh, promises of extra credit, I ask you to bring this back to your teachers in addition to anything that they might ask of you. Remember this acronym, it's BET. And I want you to make a bet on how you can take action on some of these massive world, global challenges, whether you care a lot about climate change, whether you care about health care, whether you care about economic inequality, whether you care about homelessness, mental health. There are so many things that you can put your time and energy into. Just remember, our brains cannot process large numbers, and even fractional solutions save lives. So figure out how you can take action and commit to something to your teachers that you can do to make a difference. I go back to what Bill Gates said, let's cooperate together in a way that has been completely unprecedented. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. We appreciate that uh, very, very much. So, um, a couple of questions uh, that I might uh, get us started with, if that's okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you um, talked about um, one in particular, um, cognitive bias or cognitive error that humans suffer from, not being able to process large numbers. Um, we've come to rely on artificial intelligence to do that for us. And that may turn out to be for our, our benefit or our detriment, <laughs> we'll see. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, how, as an organization, the Gates Foundation tries to overcome that, knowing that you know, organizations are composed of individuals, um, each of which, each of whom is uh, subject to these biases or these hurdles or these, these errors um, in our brain function. Um, and I assume that organizations can suffer from that as well. So I'm interested in what the Gates Foundation does to overcome that. That's a great question. Bill and Melinda Gates are incredibly active in our foundation, which is not true of all foundations, but they, um, they spend a lot of time very much in the details of what we as an organization are doing. And by their nature, they're both incredibly data-driven people. So you cannot show up to any meeting or make any proposal with a lot without a lot of data and understanding. And there's a lot of um, deep debate that happens at the organization. So we look at things from a lot of different angles and we make the best calculation that we can. If I go back to the diagnostics example we made, there's a huge chance that low-income countries will not buy these diagnostics and they won't buy them for a lot of really incredibly important reasons. If, I, if a country can spend $5 on food for people that don't have enough food or $5 on a test, who's to say what they would choose? Right. But our, we felt that the right thing to do was to make them available and then for countries to choose what's the right trade off there. It's also to say, I think we um, are cognizant that we won't always make the right decision. Um, you know, there's obviously an underlying principle of do no harm. But you can be you can definitely have data paralysis. So it is a fine line of, of recognizing that we take the best information that we can if we feel that we have huge gaps in our information that will that could dramatically um, change our perspective, we will gather that data before we act. But we also recognize that at times we have to move forward and we have to make action because inaction can also cause harm. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so kind of a, um, um, a follow-up question. Um, 
the, uh, the quote you presented from um, um, Mr. Gates, um, although he doesn't use the phrasing common good, I, that's what he's referring to uh, in that quote. And that's a, a very Jesuit notion. Um, in our, our courses here at GU in the School of Business, we focus a lot and make a lot of references to uh, the promotion of the common good. Um, for the Gates Foundation and in your work with the Gates Foundation, um, what are some of the, the, the programs, um, um, some of the um, structures that you engage in to try to keep the foundation's activities focused on just that, um, the common good? Yeah, so actually it's, a, it's an interesting question. One of the things that we promote most at the foundation is co something called global access. And that's really around how do we make products and um, services globally available throughout the world. And that can come in a variety of functions. With some of the research that we fund, we require that as part of our funding um, that the researchers make that information publicly available. Um, at little to no cost. When it comes to, uh, you know, we work with the private sector, we work with the public sector, we work with really large tech companies, we work with really small not-for-profits. And oftentimes we'll ask that if, there, if it's something that we are funding, that it needs to become publicly available. So an example of that would be is that we're working with a company in Indonesia and we're trying to figure out how we can help midwives deliver better care um, to, um, to Indonesian uh, women in childbirth. And as we work on that, we're learning a lot of things about what works and what doesn't work and how you take a group of say 40,000 midwives who we can never have enough resources to, to train in person and think about how we can do that with technology. And we're learning a lot about what works and what doesn't work. We, can, we What we're really interested though is not only solving that problem in Indonesia, but then taking it to another country where the solution won't be exactly the same, but we can take the, that same learning. We can even take that same um, code that was written for, um, for the app for the phone and say, how can we make this work in another country? And that's a huge part of what we want to see happen globally. Um, as we're sort of compiling some of the um, um, questions in, in the chat box, um, uh, I'll continue to pepper you with a few more. Um, one of the thoughts that occurs to me is that the Gates Foundation um, must encounter um, some, what may appear at first glance, insurmountable hurdles in, in, in trying to achieve um, uh, equitable treatment um, uh, with global issues like the pandemic. Could you talk about perhaps some of those hurdles that the foundation encounters in its work? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this actually happens quite a lot and it happens for a couple different reasons. And it's, um, it's, again, it's, it's all about perspective, right? So it goes back to what I was saying earlier. When we work with large um, vaccine manufacturers, large um, medicine manufacturers, um, you know, large diagnostics manufacturers, there is often a preference for whoever is going to be the fastest or highest paying um, party that, that that is who they want to work with. And in most cases, we not only um, say we want you to work with us, and it's, it is difficult um, to work in, in some of the geographies where we are particularly focused on, um, but we want you, we want, we're going to pay you less. And it's a pretty hard argument for um, especially large companies to swallow because they don't understand why we would pay them less. But a lot of what we talk about is that they wouldn't sell into these countries if it wasn't for the work that we and other global health partners do in order to make that, to facilitate that. And therefore these companies would never earn a profit from these countries anyway. And so the argument that we make to them is that we will facilitate some of the work that we know you don't want to do and you're not an expert in that. We will do that work or we will have other partners do that work. But as part of this agreement, we want you to sell us these products at cost or near cost because you wouldn't have made a profit off them otherwise. So we'd, we're not interested in getting into this argument of, you know, sell us for a little bit cheaper than in the United States because a lot of countries can't afford just a little bit cheaper. They need it a lot cheaper or there isn't the access that that countries really need. Okay, great. So um, uh, first question uh, from the audience. Since we do not have a global or a national protocol for testing, uh, what kinds of ethical logistics will be required to distribute the vaccine? Um, 
so there's a lot of conversations going there's a lot of conversation going on about that right now um there are a, a, there's a huge pact of um, high income countries middle income countries and low income countries who have come together and said this is the way that vaccines should be distributed um, there's also some um, there's also been some agreements that have been um, made to basically secure some of those lines of vaccines so that it can go through this equitable distribution process. Not everyone wants to be part of that process. There are definitely companies and countries who want um, who would find it detrimental just to themselves to enter into that process. So they're less interested in the global good and they're more interested in themselves and, and they want to basically um, take volumes of vaccines and just distribute it um, to their populations first. Our hope is that we'll know over the next number of months, but our hope is that there's multiple very promising vaccine candidates and that can be manufactured in multiple facilities throughout the world. And if that is indeed the case, then we think that there is a compelling and growing argument across countries um, to really go through a much more equitable process than would happen if we go through what I would call a me first approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, a second question, uh, and you mentioned um, in response to one of my uh, uh, early questions that um, one way the Gates Foundation as an organization tries to overcome what we might call organizational cognitive bias or errors or shortcomings is to really focus on the data and have as much data um, uh, available for decision-making as possible. So one of the attendees has asked this question, with the gathering of data and the analysis of data and the uses of technology, how are privacy issues addressed? That's a great question. Um, so there is actually some really strict privacy laws throughout the world um, that people may not be aware of, particularly coming out of Europe, but then expanding across the globe. There's significant privacy issues. And that actually leads to, while we are a data-driven organization, there's actually, um, there, are, there are significant gaps in the data that we have. So for example, the prevalence of COVID in, in many countries in Africa is much lower than we would have modeled and expected. And we still don't totally know what of that is genetic, what of that is a lack of testing and it's actually a higher prevalence than we, than we understand it to be, or what are other causes of that? Um, so data privacy really is handled on a country by country basis. Um, but I think that broadly speaking, even organizations who are data driven still lack from significant data relative to what's available in high income countries. Thank you. Um, and this question has to do with um, the proportional distribution of a vaccine to countries. Is there a forum that would enable this type of distribution to occur? Would it be the World Health Organization or others? Do we see countries willing to engage in this type of distribution protocol? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So there's a group called the ACT Accelerator, ACT Accelerator, that's convened by the World Health Organization and other organizations. And that's really what's bringing together. Um, it's bringing together high income countries who are willing to say, let's equitably distribute vaccines. It's, bring, it's also bringing together low and middle income countries. The other thing it's doing is it's asking high income countries to help pay some of the costs of these vaccines for low income countries. That may seem counterintuitive, but even if you wanted to take, whether you consider it for the common good that high income countries should help pay for low income countries because they don't have enough money, I think that is a very legitimate argument. If we wanted to be even you know, more self-focused, it is to the globe's benefit the more that we can um, reduce the spread of COVID. We don't yet know the efficacy of vaccines. And so the more that we can contain that spread, the better off we will all be. Right, thank you. I believe Professor Lighthouser has a question that was sent to her in the chat box privately rather than to the whole group. Is that correct? There's a couple actually, although I think Julie uh, started responding to this one, um, but maybe you can fill this out a, a little bit more um, and also tie it to another one that we, we received. So um, we were asked how you structure that argument for businesses and investors to um, to focus on an impact first priority rather than profit priority. Um, and you spoke to it some, but maybe we can dive into that a little bit more. And uh, along those lines, um, also the, the realities of um, working with so many different international co countries and partners that include um, other kinds of ethical um, dilemmas, political positioning, bribes, those sorts of things. 
Um, so maybe those two put together a little bit. You could dive into that a little bit more, Julie. Absolutely. So the first question probably has two pieces to it. One is what's the responsibility of governments and, the, uh, and versus what's the responsibility of the private sector? So we believe that what's going on um, with the global vaccine distribution really calls on all governments to play their part. And that means that some gov we believe some governments should pay more because they can pay more. And some governments um, will necessarily need to pay less because they simply do not have the money, but that no country should be void of a vaccine for an inability to pay. What we ask of companies is, is a bit different because we understand that companies have a fiduciary duty to shareholders and, and, and that is obviously something that's you know, required by law. But I think there's many ways that you can think about that. And this goes back to my point earlier. We, um, you know, we don't ask companies to take a loss for the work that they do with low-income countries, but it's not unreasonable to ask them to not make a profit off of low-income countries um, particularly where they would not have sought out these markets otherwise, and where we and other partners really facilitate the introduction of products in ways that the companies wouldn't have done. One of the things that, um, this actually gets to the other part of the question, one of the things we often have to think about is each country really should have the right to decide whether they introduce a certain product. And that comes naturally in the US, right? We have the FDA and decisions are made and, and products are approved or denied. But the fact of the matter is, is that each country has a slightly different calculus on what products should be available and unavailable. And that means in theory that either through a global process or on the country by country process, there should be a decision-making process about whether a vaccine or whether a, a diagnostic test is efficacious or not. There's been an unfortunately long history of poor quality products being dumped in low-income countries um, because they don't have the same capabilities of testing as we would have with say the FDA. And so there's a lot of sensitivity around that for very good reason. And one of the things we have to do on a ethical distribution is even if you're a high quality company, we still need to ensure that the product going to low income countries is of no lesser quality than it's coming um, to people here in the United States. Thank you. Um, Professor Lighthouser, do you have any more? come in for you. Uh, I have one more here. Um, uh, thinking about, I, I think thinking about the communication process going in. So um, at the same time as, as uh, um, we're going through this in incredibly difficult situation, uh, we're also getting more information than ever before and less information we can trust than ever before. And so I think from that lens, how, how do you, um, how does the Gates Foundation think about navigating those spaces given whether it's skepticism or um, some, of the, some of the conspiracies or just people less and less trusting what they're hearing because of some of those things? So uh, what are some of your strategies? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, um, I think people's sense of the news and what is a reliable source is very complex in our current reality. Um, and I, I think that there has been, you know, certainly many um, conspiracy theories that have um, wondered about the position of the Gates Foundation, just because anyone who is um, public health has been completely uninteresting, honestly, to people for years. And as of a year ago, um, Bill Gates had like, I think the highest liked rating in the world, just in terms of like a likable human being. And since all of a sudden we all now care about public health, that has gone down because of, because of the conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, on the kind of on the broader comm side of things, I let other colleagues of mine at the foundation um, sort that out, honestly, because that's not an expertise of mine. But I do think, you know, all of us figuring out what are reliable news sources or sources of information is incumbent upon all of us. And the second piece of that is really just, I think, something that Gonzaga does really well, which is just using our brains, right? Sometimes I think if someone posts something on social media and it's a friend of ours, we can just take it as at face value. But oftentimes, if you would think about these things a little bit more, I think there might be kind of a second guessing of like, does that really make sense? Like, what's the why behind that? Why, why does that, you know, how is that possible? That sounds astonishing to me and figuring out like, if it is an important data point, can you triangulate that with other sources? Right. So a couple more questions for you, Julie. Um, now that you've touched upon um, on Gonzaga and, and what we at least try to do um, with our students, 
Um, the timing of your lecture is um, quite fortuitous, in, at least in terms of the business ethics, the undergrad and the, the MBA business ethics course, because we're at that point uh, in the semester in those courses where we're talking about some broad business norms, um, you know, what we call hyper norms for the macro business contract. And one of the norms that pops up a lot is that in all business practices or business interactions, um, the participants should be treated equitably, that, that, that equitable treatment is one of these foundational values. So I wanted to ask you, um, how, how do you think about that notion of, of equitable treatment and how does it figure in the work that you do with the Gates Foundation? Right. There's, there are a lot of layers to that question. And I think, um, you know, we, we think about equity in a, from a lot of different perspectives. So um, obviously, as um, a lot of the racial justice issues have come up in the United States um, over the last, they've been there forever. Um, but as conversations have emerged more and more over the past number of months, we even think about what's so our own composition of the foundation and where are we located and are we partnering with the right organizations or have we made um, you know, intentional or unintentional biases around who we hire and um, what we promote within the organization. And then that can scale out to like something much larger of who are our partners that we're working with in this organization. And then ultimately who are our ultimate beneficiaries and are we really, is there, um, is their voice heard in the decisions that the foundation is making or how we choose to fund different work or not? Um, and is it, are they really represented there? So I think there's like, that's probably the foundation's lens. And then I think the second piece of that is how do we influence others on that same equitable journey? And I think um, that is, um, you know, that's definitely an art to bring others along there to think about how do we influence governments? How do we influence the private sector um, and other partners to think in a similarly equitable manner? Um, because we were not all born in the same set of circumstances. And, um, and, and yet we will all be better off the more that we can think about it from an equitable lens as opposed to a zero sum game. Okay, great. Um, another question uh, from the audience. For those working, uh, let me scroll down so I can read the whole thing. For those working in the area of shareholder advocacy, what recommendations would you give um, so as to engage with shareholders of companies in this dialogue and the kind of dialogue you've described, perhaps some do's and don'ts? <laughs> I, I, I don't pretend to be an expert in this space, but I will talk a little bit about actually what my specific team does at the foundation. So we are, um, over the past year or so, we've made some very specific um, gender statements. And that has to do with the fact that on um, we often take board observer roles in the uh, companies that we invest in. And many of them happen to have only male leadership and only male board of directors. And um, we don't believe that makes sense. Um, and so we have stopped investing in companies that are not willing to adjust that policy um, prior to us uh, making an equity investment. I think we are going through a similar process um, related to larger DEI topics. And I think our policy will further evolve over the next year. And that's obviously unique to us. That doesn't um, talk about shareholder advocacy, but I think there are many ways that each of us um, can make an important statement. And at this point in time, the data proves it all, right? Like the more that you have balanced, equitable companies, the better the company will succeed. I think that data has proven itself over and over again. Mm -hmm. And last year was a, um, um, in some ways, a kind of landmark year. Um, we had both the business roundtable issuing its statement on uh, a shareholder, a stakeholder approach to corporations and uh, the BlackRock CEO in his letter um, and saying that they were now going to focus on just the kinds of governance structures you mentioned in terms of uh, their investments. Um, so another, another question, and this has to do with um, trying to differentiate or, or deal with um, sort of hometown biases that we might have. So as individuals may be more inclined to favor allocating resources to vulnerable domestic communities, how do you advocate for the support of global communities and deal with those biases of helping your own country or neighbor before supporting the global community? It's a good question. I, 
as far as I'm concerned, if people want to help their local community, I'm just as supportive of it, right? Like there are people in need everywhere you look, whether it's in your neighborhood or whether it's in your community or whether it's in our globe. And I think that if people are willing to reach out and support and help others, um, I'm not too hung up on whether that just, if, it, if that wants to be local, that is, that is still bettering our world. Um, it is harder to access the global community and know where to make a difference unless you're deeply involved in this world. There are large organizations that people know, like UNICEF and, um, you know, Save the Children or whatever. There is, you know, a handful of large organizations that people know well, but it is difficult to know how to make, uh, you know, a global impact in such a way unless you know this work well. So I'm good with anything. <laughs> and, and, and that fits with the fractional solution yeah. approach, correct? So another question from the audience, with some countries enacting more isolationist public health policies in recent years, for example, the U.S. withdrawal from the World Health Organization, does the Gates Foundation, in your opinion, uh, and, and not necessarily speaking for the foundation, but do you believe the Gates Foundation has a moral obligation to fill that gap uh, as a global institution or rather bridge the divide between nations? Good question. So um, we were the second largest funder of the WHO um, and uh, still are because actually there's it's a long process between what Congress can change and what the president can change as it relates to the World Health Organization. So what people have seen in the media is not completely the full story on what's happening with support for the World Health Organization. With that said, I think so we have two views. One, without organizations like the World Health Organization, low-income countries and small countries will never be well served. They they're just uh, they don't get the attention that they need when there's you know 200 plus countries in the world. So we need a mechanism like that if we intend to value people's lives throughout the world. The foundation itself tries to walk a very careful line between what are we uniquely capable of doing. And the idea that if the foundation solves all these problems, that other, other organizations or other governments will abdicate their own responsibility. We're the largest foundation in the world, but we're a drop in the ocean compared to the budgets of governments throughout the world. And so we need and depend on large donations from governments and other organizations to continue the work that we, that we believe in. Thank you. Uh, another question from, from the audience. Um, from an ethical standpoint and sort of from your perspective, um, given the work that you do, uh, what can communities and societies do to help with the coming local or global solutions to COVID? I mean, in other words, how can they participate in the solutions? Great. I, I think there are literally so many things we can do. It starts with individual responsibility of ensuring that we are doing the best we can to not spread COVID. I think it's also around things like, again, take, how can we take care of our community? Um, Low-income populations in every one of our communities have been hit incredibly hard economically by what's going on. And whether that's donating to local homeless organizations or food banks or whatever, I think that can make a huge, uh, that can make a huge, uh, be a huge help. Broadly speaking, I think it's supporting global organizations. Again, there are organizations like UNICEF and others whose direct mandate is around providing um, supplies to low-income countries. And they do that in part by if low-income countries have money, then they'll buy them on their behalf, but they also do it through donations. And there's a large donor community coming together for COVID vaccines and otherwise um, that can obviously um, be kind of an easy way to think about how we can support the more global community. Good, thank you. Um, so given the experience you've had, um, could you speak to the extent to which um, private business has um, been supportive of or getting itself involved in addressing uh, an equitable um, distribution system for vaccines and other therapeutics when they come about? Absolutely. That has happened on a huge, uh, huge scale. So I can think of a of a local company just outside of Seattle who called me, you know, in late March and said, hey, we are, uh, they manufacture um, something for Boeing and they basically said, hey, we wanna turn some of our line around and we can start making N95 masks right now. Can you connect me to local hospitals in Washington state, right? And they, 
it was a privately held company. And so they could just make the decision on the spot. We don't really care how much money we lose in the next month. This is the thing that we need to do for the sake of our community. And it was really inspiring to see. And I think we saw that across the globe. I saw engineers from Canada and the United States building ventilators when there weren't enough ventilators and say, hey, we just built this thing. It works. It costs less than what you can get from the global manufacturers where there's not enough supply. How can we get this into hospitals? I think on the larger scale, we're now working with um, vaccine manufacturers um, and other companies that produce um, the therapies or the drugs that we that we believe will need to accompany vaccines. And we're really working with them to say, how can we build out more capacity, more lines so that when the uh, when the products are available, they can be distributed in mass quantity. So there's kind of from the very local to the very global, um, we're seeing a lot of different um, efforts to, to support the, the community. Great, thank you. Um, now I, I, I'd like to, um, as we do with um, all of our ARM lectures, especially those, um, and we've been lucky enough to have a number of GEO alums um, uh, um, deliver the ARM lecture. Um, and, and since you now have put a challenge in front of our students <laughs> to uh, um, challenge us to have a certain conversation with them, um, could you say a little bit um, about how um, your education here at Gonzaga, your Jesuit education has both prepared you for your career and where you find yourself in your career now, and also benefits the kinds of endeavors that the Gates Foundation is uh, trying to achieve. Absolutely. So first I will just, um, I will actually say very quickly that uh, as many of the students will experience, you know, in 20 years time from now, I think I was surrounded by just an absolutely phenomenal set of peers and um, including Dr. Brasich and Dr. Hogue, who happened to teach in the accounting department, um, and, and many other peers who have just gone on to do tremendous things uh, with their careers and with their families and in their personal lives. One of the things that I notice on specifically at the foundation is I am the sole person on my team who does not have um, Ivy League or other kind of very distinguished um, you know, schools backing them. They often have multiple degrees. Um, they have they have gone to very highly respected academic institutions, and then went on the very prestigious um, companies in on the East Coast and the West Coast and London, etc. And I'm the sole exception of that. And if you look at my background versus their backgrounds, it, it's very stark. And the reason for that. Um, People are often surprised to hear more of my background. And I think here's the thing that Gonzaga does so, so well is you've developed the whole person. You, um, Gonzaga students come out having a real compassion for others, having a real ability to listen, having an ability to read the room and to pick up on a lot of soft skills that cannot be measured um, in the same way that some of these hard skills um, can be measured. And they may, do, they may not initially appear on resumes in the same way, but when people get to know you and they know what you can do and they know the quality of your work, it impacts everything you do. How I negotiate with people is incredibly effective because I've known how to work with a huge variety of people. Um, how I partner with people is, is unique. And I think that's what really Gonzaga brings out. The hard skills that we've built in accounting and finance and at the business school um, provide a lot of immediate value when you come out of college. But the thing that really serves longer term is that we all know how to build relationships with each other. We know, um, we know how to work with people who are vastly different from ourselves and very similar from ourselves. And we play off of each other's strengths. And that ultimately will always serve you well. Great. Um one of the things we talk about with our students um, is this idea of thinking about um, their future careers as business leaders in terms of this Jesuit idea of a noble vocation. Um, so now you get a chance to speak directly to our students and give them some advice on how they might do that, um, how they might think about now their future careers, and practicing whatever concentration it may be, accounting, finance, management, um, uh, HR, marketing, on down the line, if they really did want to 
um, become business leaders in this model of a noble vocation, what advice would you give them? I think within the first few years after graduating from Gonzaga, most people have all of their expenses covered, no matter what type of vocation you choose, right? You, you, with a few years of work, you can cover all your basic living costs and that grows over time and it can grow exponentially in some fields and it can grow slower in other fields. But pretty early on, I realized that I'm a person who's motivated by the work I do more than the money I make. And so for me, I was super comfortable choosing a career that made less money because every day I go into work and I, I, I truly love the work that I do. Um, I get to work with incredibly smart people. Every day I learn something new. I can talk to you about animal vaccines and U.S. education and a whole variety of topics that to me are really interesting and I think hopefully make a difference. And that is a huge driving factor. And for whatever salary I have lost over the years, I've never batted an eye and I would not change this for the for the world. I'm, I'm super happy with the choice that I made there. Right. I have other friends who have made a ton of money and they can do equally awesome things with it. They work in very honorable professions. Um, they share a lot of that with the local community um, and they're able to do a lot of other things. So I think it's, um, there's many paths that you can do, but I think remembering where we came from and how much has been given, us, given to us to be the people that we are, we just have to remember that that needs to go back. Right. Um, we will throw one more question at you because it's it's obviously it comes from someone who knows a little bit about you <laughs> because they've asked this question uh what has been more fulfilling for you your current role at gates your time in nicaragua which you might have to explain <laughs> or your time in public accounting <laughs> um so uh, yeah, as a backstory um after so I did public accounting after I left Gonzaga, and then I went and spent a couple of years in Nicaragua as part of Jesuit volunteers doing microfinance with women in, in Managua. And in terms of what has been most fulfilling, um, I, they're all unique. They've all added to my career, but absolutely uh, the work that I do right now, it, I find incredibly fulfilling because I do think it makes a difference and I learn something every day and I work with really smart, passionate people and it's hard to ask for a whole lot more than that in a, in a career. Great. And, and I'm sure that doesn't make Professor Hogue and Brassage uh, sad to hear you uh, say that. <laughs> so I want to just thank you again, Julie, uh, for being with us this evening. Um, we are so proud uh, as an institution to say we played at least some small role um, in who you've become and the magnificent work that you've engaged in. So again, thank you for being our Aram lecturer this year. Um, please stay well. Um, much success uh, in the work ahead. And thank you. Best of luck to everyone. Thank you so much for your time tonight.